So I'm going to introduce our main event here. All right. So first of all, thank you, Jeff. Um, people didn't catch it. My name's Clinton Hilliard, and I'm the programs director for Uncoach Chesapeake. And I want to welcome everyone again tonight for attending this month's virtual lecture. A few preliminaries. Uh, as usual, we'll be raffling off a door prize to one lucky attendee. Um, and we'll be populating our uh, famous raffle wheel with the names of uh, the Eventbrite registrations. Those will be, I'll be using the emails that you all registered with for uh, contacting me. Uh, second, um, there'll be time after the talk for questions. So save, save your questions, but feel free to type the questions that come to mind in the chat during the presentation. And then um, at the end, uh, the speaker will get to them. All right, so, oh, one last thing. The, uh, the raffle prize is actually, uh, the book is written by um, our uh, presenter tonight. It's called uh, Don't Panic, The Absolute Beginner's Guide to Managing Interfaces. All right, so um, tonight we're very honored to have with us Mr. Paul Davies. He's brought to us uh, in coordination with uh, Project Performance International. Um, but Mr. Davis is uh, semi-retired, he says, and he was previously the um, discipline manager for systems engineering at the Network Rail Infrastructure Projects in the United Kingdom. Um, interesting title, but in that role, he was responsible for promoting improvements in process and um, practitioner competence in systems engineering. Uh, prior to this, he worked for uh, Thales in the United Kingdom, acquiring nearly 30 years experience in systems engineering research, innovation management, uh, systems engineering functional leadership, project engineering management, systems integration, and even has done some mathematical modeling and uh, performance analysis while there. Uh, to prevent boredom in his retirement, uh, Paul delivers consultancy and training in all aspects of systems engineering. So with all that, I'm going to now turn it the, the presentation over to Mr. Davies. Go ahead and uh, okay. start off. Thank you very much, Clinton. Right, hoping you can see my screen okay, everybody? And hear yes. me? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, right, so my name's Paul Davis. Uh, I'm a Brit, as you'll tell more or less instantly. <clears throat> and as Clinton very nicely introduced me, I've got sort of 35 years plus uh, experience in systems engineering and project engineering management mainly. Um, I'm sort of retired and sort of not because after about a year of retirement, I realised I was uh, a bit bored. Uh, and decided that it was about time I started giving something back. So uh, I just do a little part-time training, uh, mostly for PPI, as he said. In fact, about 18 months ago, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to uh, deliver a training course at the Kosyukov lab at Johns Hopkins in your chapter. So I know the area a little. It's a very nice place. Thank you. Um, and what's this talk about? It's uh, based on experience I had as uh, head of a group of uh, project design authorities where I got pretty fed up with people coming to me having failed testing in system integration. Um, and it was always down to the interfaces. Uh, they had not specified them or they'd not been properly designed for or properly tested and it all fell apart in totally predictable ways. So when I had a go at them about this, they would say, well, where do we go for help? There's nothing in the literature and there's no decent training on how to do interfaces. And I felt sure that that couldn't be true, but having done some research, I think it is. So nothing I'm gonna say this evening is rocket science. It's all known, known through uh, engineering heuristics, but it's not well documented. And what there is in the literature uh, is singularly unhelpful in my opinion. So uh, let's look at some basics and let's look at uh, some of the reasons 
why they are not more widely known or more widely practiced. So the aims are to challenge the perception of an engineer as someone who ignores the world outside their system element. There is a massive tendency for engineers to want just to design their own part and not worry about uh, interacting with other teams, other engineers, other disciplines, or other systems. Also to remove the excuse there's no training or guidance on interfaces. And more than that, to move away from what is prevalent in the literature uh, about the place of dealing with interfaces in the system lifecycle, and to turn the world outside in, if you like, to reorganize our concepts in architecting around interfaces rather than uh, trying to treat them as an afterthought. Okay, uh, and on the right hand side, you'll see uh, a little book that I wrote to a company. Well, actually this came kind of first. Uh, firstly, I developed an internal training course, delivered it at a couple of UK events. I've delivered it, uh, the training course at a couple of international symposia. But this is part of a, a Incosi UK chapter series, which I'll talk about right at the end. But that's, you know, plugging the book is not the point of this. Okay, so outline of what I'm going to talk about. And I also want to say that this is the last slide with bullet points or indeed many words until the summary at the end. So if you want some record of the detail, yes, there's a, a certain amount in the recording of the, uh, of the lecture, but uh, there's a paper that accompanies this, which Clinton has a copy of and will be posting on the Chesapeake website, I believe, uh, or, or by the book, um, but I'll talk about that later. So I'm gonna have a look at what is in the literature to start with. Then I'm gonna talk about a very important philosophical construct called the somebody else's problem field. We're gonna look at some of the elements of best practice. I'm gonna just set you a challenge along the way uh, for you to think about and talk to, uh, talk to us about afterwards. I'm gonna give you an example of what I mean by left shifting in consideration of interfaces in architecting. Uh, if we have time, I might touch on some residual common problems even after you think you've uh, altered your architecting style. I'm going to talk about a whole life cycle approach to uh, interfaces and then so finally there'll be some con conclusions and an opportunity for questions. Okay, so let's have first of all have a look at what's in the literature. So I'm going to start with IEEE 1220, uh, one of the oldest and probably best known uh, early standards on systems engineering. It's actually called Application and Management of the Systems Engineering Process. Um, quite old now, <clears throat> it's maybe going to be revised. It starts as early as page three with a view of a system in the form of a system breakdown structure about which I'll say a few more critical words in a bit, um, but there's nothing in those early sections about interfaces. It goes on to talk about a uh, progression of process steps in achievement of uh, a system, starting with requirements and going on through functional design, physical design and specification and so on. And there is a table that supports that those process steps, which in effect, adds uh, treatment of interfaces as an afterthought, a, a, just a, a sweeping up housekeeping process uh, at the end of each phase. So do your requirements, then think about interface requirements. Do your functional design, then think about functional interfaces. Do your physical design, then think about physical interfaces. Um, which was the thinking at the time but in practice, it doesn't work terribly well. Okay, so then we move on to what my general generally is a better standard, EIA 632, 
um, which has a grand total of seven lines in it about interfaces, one of which is generally held to be bad practice these days, and it repeats the same table from IEEE 1220 about the place of interfaces as a housekeeping activity at the end of each phase. Moving on, uh, there are actually a couple of useful standards. There, there's one from NASA and a couple from NIST, Training Manual for Elements of Interface Definition and Control, and so on. They have their place provided your interface is about software and communications. But in terms of helping you with electrical and mechanical interfaces, it's almost no help whatsoever. And they also tell you what to put in an interface specification, how to document it. It doesn't tell you about anything about analysis methods or how you get to the position where you're um, able to write that specification. Okay, so that's standards. Uh, in terms of INCOSI literature, we've got the Systems Engineering Handbook, which is not bad. There's section 4.4 on architecture definition, which has a treatment of what is christened in there uh, coupling matrices, which is quite old fashioned terminology, but serviceable nevertheless, uh, but it's light on detail. Uh, and the section at the very end of the book on interface management as a cross cutting technology uh, is thin in the extreme and not particularly helpful. Uh, then we move on to the CBOC, the, which is much, much better. It's good. Uh, there are ele good elements of the interface story lists scattered throughout, but it is in the form of a wiki. So it is quite hard to get an end to end view uh, if, you're, if your job description is sorting out the interfaces, in terms of following the CBOC through from what you do uh, uh, about interfaces as part of a project lifecycle, it's quite hard to follow. What about books on the subject? Well, actually, probably the best book around is by a guy called Jeff Grady on system integration, but which was written, I think now over 30 years ago, it's out of print and copies are changing hands on uh, eBay and Amazon books for over $300 a pop. So you've got to be fairly determined. It's also not an easy read. It's well over 700 pages. Uh, it treats all sorts of subjects as well as interfaces. Uh, and you've got to be pretty determined to, to work your way through it. Um, a better bet is a book by a former colleague of mine, Hilary Silito, who is the chief systems engineer at Talis, uh, on architecting systems, published about three years ago, um, which is quite erudite. Like the man himself, he's full of really great thinking, but his uh, his stuff is quite quite hard to follow if you're a beginner, which is why I decided to have a go at writing a book for beginners. Okay, so in summary, the gap analysis is we've got a lot of in the literature about the what in terms of what goes in the specification, but not the how you do the analysis and how you get there. It's mostly about software and communications, not multidisciplinary. Uh, there's nothing about iteration between interfaces and um, if you like uh, system elements as uh, part of the, your architecture uh, and helping letting the interfaces inform decisions you make at earlier stages in the process. Uh, and there's no life cycle view of what you do. Okay, so I'm now gonna talk about the somebody else's problem field. The guy on the left is uh, Cambridge alumnus, just who was there just before me. Uh, who wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, I'm hoping some of you at least will be familiar with it. And he introduced this really important concept of the somebody else's problem field, which he defined as something we can't see or don't see, or our brain doesn't let us see because we think it's somebody else's problem. 
it's like it's a, sorry the brain just just edit it edits it out it's like a blind spot and if we're not careful interfaces can uh, become exactly like that interfaces can become the part of the somebody else's problem field the picture on the right depicts a famous dialogue between two of the greatest uh, philosophers of western science Bertrand Russell and Ludwig von Wittgenstein, uh, also at my college in Cambridge, about, about 60, 70 years ago, where uh, Wittgenstein tried to convince Russell that just because he couldn't see a pink rhinoceros in the room doesn't mean that there wasn't one there. And uh, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, requirements and also interfaces are exactly like that pink rhinoceros. In terms of what we have to achieve in our projects and our system developments, they're there whether we see them and consider them or not. And we won't get to a successful system unless we explicitly acknowledge them and treat them appropriately. Okay, so why does this matter? Um, well, and how does it manifest itself? So I'm going to show you two pictures about different views of how we think about systems. The first one is called the Seven Samurai Model, courtesy of a, a brilliant guy called James Martin, who's now at the Aerospace Corporation, uh, who wrote this classic systems engineering paper called the Seven Samurai, in which he describes in any system development, there are actually seven systems at play. So we start in the top left hand corner with a context system, S1. This is, if you like, the entire problem space within which we are going to be required to operate. And the whole reason for being of our system is that there is a problem in that context system space called the problem P1. And where we would like to get to is a context system where we have a deployed system, S4, that's our fully completed system, uh, which addresses that problem P1. But in fact, because time has moved on, we now have a modified context system, S1 dashed, in which there may be a new problem, P2, which may be addressed, caused or completely ignored, ignored by our deployed system. But on the way to getting that deployed system, we have to uh, conceive of it uh, in the form of an intervention system intended to address the context system, which hopefully when fielded becomes our deployed system. And that is in itself created, envisaged, realized and deployed within the context of a realization system, S3. That's per perhaps, our extended enterprise and our supply chain, which is devoted to addressing the problem on behalf of the customer uh, and creating the system and turning it into the deployed system. Once it, there, once it is there, it needs uh, to be supported by a sustainment system, which is S6. In operation, it interacts with collaborating systems, S5, and there may be competing systems, S7, either competing for the contract to address P1 or uh, perhaps misuse or terrorist attack or anything competing with the deployed system in its context. So this is in the form of an influence diagram uh, with lots of arrows showing all of those interactions which become either system interfaces or organizational interfaces, all of which are there on the figure waiting to be addressed. Now let's compare that with, that's not how as engineers, we typically envisage our systems. As soon as we are faced with a problem in our heads, a few milliseconds later, we think about what, does our, what might our intervention system look like? And that's it. That, that's the sum total of our thinking. And we think about it in terms of a system breakdown structure. 
So if, for example, the solution is an air traffic control system, we drew it like this, where it is composed of perhaps some radars, a control tower, some infrastructure services. And if we're lucky, somebody might think of the enabling systems that might be needed to create it and support it. Uh, so I'm going to let you consider that diagram for a few seconds. What do you notice? OK, what you should have noticed is that all the interfaces have disappeared. You cannot see one single interface in a system breakdown structure. OK, why is that important? It's important because having created our system breakdown structure, we're probably then going to go on to define a project work breakdown structure based on the SBS. And we're going to allocate work packages to each of those radars, each of these control tower elements. Oh, ah, and now nobody has got a work breakdown structure allocation to sorting out the interfaces. We have created in one fell swoop the somebody else's problem field just by focusing on the system breakdown structure. OK, again, why does that matter? Can't we just allocate a work breakdown structure element to interfaces in the same way as we do to system elements? Well, it matters be precisely because of this. We get requirements like system A shall interface to system B via a bearer X. OK, where we've got an interface control mechanism, we've got a, a data or other information, mass energy or information exchange and we might have a mandated interface bearer. Right, okay, fine. Uh, let's, let's assume that the organization responsible for implementing system of it, our system of interest, A, is different from the organization responsible for system B. All very well and good if the interface happens uh, miraculously without anybody needing to change. But what happens if the ends don't match or it's undefined or a system that's already in service has to be modified to accommodate the new interface? What we get is this. Uh, people in system A will be telling people in system B, you've got to change. And people in system B will be saying to people from system A, no, you change. That we have no budget for the change. Well, actually, because of our progression through the system break, breakdown structure to the work breakdown structure, nobody's got the budget for the change. So we have this Mexican standoff. So that's reason one. Reason two is the explosion factor. If I decompose at my top level a system into five elements, um, if you count them, we uh, have a potential for 10 uh, interface interfaces between those five system elements. Now, we've also got interfaces to external systems. If I've got five external systems that I, we need to talk to and we're clever and we organize our architecture such that only one of our system elements has to uh, talk to the outside world, we have still created five extra interfaces. With lazy uh, architecting, we might multiply that up to five times five quite easily, where every one of our system elements has some form of interface, whether it's mass, energy, or information, with all five of those external systems. And the problem gets uh, progressively worse as we go down through the levels of decomposition. So in principle, uh, if your each level of decomposition goes up by a factor of n, the number of inter potential interfaces goes up with the order of n squared. So uh, we need to be a bit cleverer than that and manage the complexity explosion, which also applies to the uh, cost estimation, by the way because the, the more levels of decomposition you have, the more relative effort you need to spend on interfaces rather than system elements. Um, that's not just true in design, uh, but we've also got this problem about traceability between uh, document, 
documentation elements. So here's my example from requirements, even when I'm only decomposing into three subsystems um, with a set of e external interfaces, I've got three sets of interface specifications to sort out between the internal elements plus three sets of external interfaces. And the problem with each of those interface specifications is that they probably need to trace not only to their parent specification, but also because they are double ended, they need to trace to two separate documents, which gives you a configuration management nightmare. Uh, and just to add to the pain, uh, that is true on all three uh, elements here for requirements, for design and for test. Uh, and the configuration control getting both ends of the interface to agree in the event of changes uh, becomes very quickly out of control if, unless you have very strict management. Okay, so having said all that, um, Can we just treat that in the way that the software literature does? Well, maybe not. Uh, I'm just giving you this as a, a little example from rail. Uh, this is um, overhead line electrification, which is big business, certainly in the UK and Western Europe, where all of the high speed rail lines and by high speed, I mean anything up to 300, uh, 300 miles per hour um, is done through overhead line electrification rather than diesel power um, and the pantogra the interface I'm talking about is just between the pantograph the overhead pantograph arm which is sprung tensioned to maintain contact with the overhead line at uh, 25,000 or 40,000 volts what's the interface intended for it's intended to transmit electrical voltage and current from a remote uh, power generation system to our locomotive and to the rest of the train systems. So the intended form of the interface is electrical voltage and current, and there may be spikes, of course. But also a byproduct of that interface are vertical forces between the sprung loaded arm and the overhead line, which are time varying longitudinal forces due to friction, heat, just uh, due to the fact that they could be at different temperatures as well, flash arcing when the arm momentarily loses contact with the line, electromagnetic field flux. Let me tell you that, you know, uh, transferring whatever 200 amps at 25,000 volts over a line that's moving at 200 miles per hour generates one hell of an electromagnetic field. Um, which interferes with, of course, all of your mobile phone signals. Uh, there's uh, vibrational forces and potentially resonant frequencies at all of the joints on the line and shock, uh, but also there is mass transfer, moisture and salt deposition, carbon deposits, rust, uh, crud uh, or uh, salt, um, ice, all sorts of things as unintentional interface residues. And uh, what you'll notice is that there's no software or communications traveling over that interface, and yet they are complex and need to be managed. Uh, I say that at as I currently speak, I know there are future plans to pass uh, software communications over the line as well. Okay, so before I move on, uh, sorry, um, I'm going to ask you, um, having said all that, I'm going to look at eight basic best practices that we kind of know about, uh, but maybe haven't seen them written down very well, or they're not adhered to in practice. We know about them, but that's not the way it's done around here. So what I want you to do is mentally think about which of these eight do I know about? Which of these eight do my company practice? And which of these eight should my company be practicing? Okay, best practice one is what I call the separation principle. 
This is the idea that there is a notional plane of the interface, even if there isn't a physical one. And to keep uh, things in their rightful place. So your interface documentation should only cover what is passed across the interface and the form of the interface. Nothing about what each end does in response to that interface. So anything that system A has to do in response to the interface goes in the system A spec. Anything that system B has to do goes in the system B spec and they don't duplicate each other. Why? Because if one end changes, you cannot be sure that you've got a consistent set. This is the, the set of documentation that gives you the least headaches in managing change uh, and enforcing consistency uh, in the events that the two systems are being developed, put into service, upgraded or whatever asynchronously. This is the form that gives you the fewest headaches. So keep, make sure that you've got an interface specification that is separate from the specification of each end. Okay, best practice two is your system, your high level systems description absolutely should have a context diagram. Key things about the context diagram, it's got a system boundary, drawn it as an ellipse in the middle. It separates what's inside the system or the scope of supply from what's outside. And you'd be amazed how many arguments that can cause. If you put eight people in a room, you'll get an argument about what's inside and what's outside. It has things that interface with the system, not just collaborating systems, as uh, James Martin put it, but also users uh, and uh, environments and resources which it relies upon. Things like power, external power, it interfaces with the weather, it might uh, have, uh, have, have heat and dust being transmitted across the system boundary, including resources that are not part of the system, but are the system needs in order for elements of the system to communicate with each other and with the outside world like a wide area network. And it's also got those interfaces numbered so that you've got a master list that you can use for res reference for resolution. Right, next best practice. Do you know what is passing across those interfaces and in what order? Uh, and this is classic um, software notation but the metaphor can be applied to electrical and mechanical uh, interchanges as well, mass, energy and information exchanges. Do you know what's going where and in what order and what the logical sequences are? So you have all of your use cases and misuse cases uh, and of your inter interchange sequences represented in the form of sequence diagrams. Best practice four is using layered models as patterns. This is the OSI seven layer model, which is uh, prevalent in software and communications. Um, moving, going from layer seven application software interfacing, this is your um, high level software ap applications talking to each other, but relying on successively lower levels right down to levels, layers three and two, which is TCP IP, and layer one, which is the physical pins, voltages, the, 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 the cabling and wires itself. Um, <clears throat> and it relies on, uh, let me see now, each layer achieves what it needs to achieve at that layer by means of using the lower layers as services with very stable managed interfaces. Very useful in software and comms, but we can extend that metaphor even for our electrical pantograph system, because what we would like to do at the very highest level is treat that pantographic arm as representation of the power delivery from the external electrical power system to 
the train electro electrical and motive system. So power delivery and power usage at the highest or application layer. Uh, but and to be able to write an interface spec between the two at that level without worrying about how the lower levels are to be achieved, then uh, we can define uh, service layers below that as how do we do load balancing again by uh, monitoring what happens across that line. And then we can go right down to the physical wiring and connectors, overhead lines, pantograph arm, cabling and power buses internal to the train uh, and getting it to uh, the locomotive power system itself. And we have broken, rather than having to put all of that in one humongous interface specification, we've broken it down into the service oriented uh, vertical arrow interfaces, which are relatively standard and unchanging with the, uh, let's see now, yeah, enterprise to enterprise in many cases, interface specifications that do have to be crafted and agreed, which are in the, uh, the oval loops representing the, the it, interfaces at that appropriate level. Okay, best practice five is uh, using N squared charts, which is a, a more modern interpretation of uh, the coupling matrices, uh, whereby we put our system of interest as a black box without worrying about what's inside it in the top left hand corner. Then we have our users, a physical environment uh, and however many external systems we need to talk to and uh, we work out what is communicating or exchanging mass energy or interfacing with what uh, and looking at it as a sequence of interchanges going clockwise around the uh, table. Um, an alternative form is design structure matrices which I believe follows the uh, opposite convention that they go anti-clockwise, but um, I've always used N squared charts. And we can extend that to have a white box N squared chart where we decompose our system into its constituent or candidate constituent elements, because there's always more than one potential way that we can decompose our system, where we have an N squared chart internal to our system in the top left hand corner in a darker gray, which we consider cell by cell. And again, we look at all of our electrical, mechanical, software, com communications, environmental, all of those cell by cell. We may have several different classes of users, several different uh, classes of environments that different elements of our system encounter. Um, and we don't care about the interfaces between those, or at least we shouldn't have to. We only worry about our HCO outputs to the users and the users control inputs to our system uh, and likewise to the environments, to and from the environments and the external systems. If we have to care about interchanges between the external systems, that because they directly impact what's happening inside our system, that probably means we've got a missing end interface that we need to uh, research and get sorted out. Best practice seven is to try and reorganize our system decomposition, our architecture uh, within our system in the top left-hand corner so that we have as few of those uh, elements populated that where they basically they daisy chain down an order and back up an order. Uh, uh, the, adjacent to the leading diagonal. So we have minimized the number of interfaces that we need to worry about. We've only got one system element responsible for interacting with users, one responsible for protecting us from the environment and one responsible for dealing with communications with the external systems. Um, there's some complicated mathematics around that in the literature, which you can find, but most of it's flawed. So I wouldn't bother, just do the best you can. 
And best practice eight is talking, it's starting to talk about life cycles because we need to acknowledge that we don't just need to worry about the N squared chart for the end deployed system. Um, we should start with drawing an N squared chart for the legacy system. What did it look like before we inserted our system? What inter interchanges, interactions do we need to understand in order to optimize what we do with our ev eventual system? Does our de in eventual sys deployed system have multiple states and modes? in which case we may, may need to draw different N squared charts for those di different deployed modes. And are there important intermediate configuration states along the way between the legacy system and the deployed system modes? There could be many of those to do with integration testing, to do with acceptance testing, to do with field trials, to do with uh, diagnostic equipment fitted for um, failure failure mode investigation so we need to think about those configuration states and make sure that they are catered for in our interface capture analysis and design okay so those are the eight best practices uh, i want you to think about those how many do, does your organization do where where do you think the gaps are what are you going to do about it Okay, uh, how am I doing for time, by the way? Somebody break in? Uh, how much more time you need? It's a quarter, it's about um, 25 till, I think. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. 20 minutes. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. okay, so uh, I'm gonna tell you, show you what I mean about left shifting. If I read IEEE 1220, this is kind of what it looks like. I'm going to go through requirements, then architecting, then logical and functional design, and then physical design. Uh, and I'm going to treat interface design at successive levels in the bottom right hand corner of each of those steps with no feedback loop. But where I think we need to get to is where we uh, do a bit of requirements, a bit of architecting, a bit of logical and functional design, and we treat interface analysis as an essential component of each of those steps. Think about the impact, especially at things like physical design, and say, actually, that imposes major constraints on our requirements in the first place. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that. Let's go back to our pantograph example. So let's look at those different types of interface uh, that I talked about. The intended interface is the transfer of the electrical voltage and current. And we can rely upon the designers to get that right, uh, even if they're from different organizations. That's their day job. Uh, they know what they're doing. They know what is expected. They'll get that right. If you've got decent design teams who know what they're doing, you can probably rely on them to get the blue ones right as well, that get the vertical forces. So you'll get the damping on the pantograph arm correct based on the tension of the cable, which is somebody else's design. They probably can talk to each other. You can rely on them to talk to each other and get that right. Likewise, the longitudinal forces. However, the ones in red, Dealing with the flash arcing, uh, the RFI due to the electromagnetic field flux, the shock at the joints, and particularly the things like moisture and salt deposition and the carbon deposits and clearing ice. What you may well find is that the pantograph arm designer is designing, assuming that the overhead line is going to get cleaned every day, it will never have ice on it. It's their responsibility to make sure that there's no loose uh, carbon deposits on it. And likewise, the overhead line manufacturer may say, that's not our problem. You need to clean it, you know, um, sweep that off with your pantograph arm and clean it off every day. So you can see how the somebody else's problem field has happened. That needs to be managed. 
So we need to consider all of those potential exchanges across the interface. They drive um, additional functional and non-functional requirements on the system elements at each end that need to be handled at the requirement stage, not left to when you start on the physical design. Okay. Right, there are still some residual architecting decision patterns for interfaces that there is no right answer to. And this comes down to uh, considerations of centralization versus distributed architectures. Uh, I'll just pick on a couple of examples. Built in test is a good one. So you're going to want your system to be able to diagnose itself if it goes wrong. Well, one way of doing it is to have a very intelligent central unit that knows everything that is uh, present in the system and how it should behave. And it generates test signals, distributes all of those test signals to everywhere else in the system and interprets the answers, which has the advantage that it puts the all of the design in one place. So there are fewer design interfaces, but in terms of implementation, it's a very high workload on that particular unit and the design team doing it, and they will need organizationally to interface with everybody else to understand what the other bits do. And it can end up with some very complicated cabling between those system elements. The other way of doing it is to have it distributed uh, with the central unit saying to each individual unit, you know how to test yourself, test yourself and tell me whether you're okay or not, which is uh, logically simpler uh, and results in fewer uh, electromechanical interfaces between the elements. But on the other hand, how confident can you be that uh, the sum of the parts add up, adds up to the whole? And control is extremely similar. Comms, do you let each bit um, talk to the outside world in independently or do you focus it all through a central unit? Power, am I going to put um, mains power to all of my system elements and allow them to down convert to the power of the electrical voltages that they need, uh, which might have a safety issue because you've got a rather larger number of high voltage cables. Or do you have one centralized unit that does all of the down conversion to all of the different low voltages and distributes all of those low voltages, which ends up in more cables, but perhaps safer, but may give you a single point of failure. There's all sorts of arguments like that, where, which lead to um, my sometimes referring to architecting is the, the art and science of finding the least bad solution rather than the best. But whatever, you need to look at the interfaces and take informed decisions rather than, again, sometimes these particular design aspects uh, get tacked on at the end uh, when no one else has thought about them properly. OK, uh, so what we're going to do is take a life cycle approach. We're going to first of all draw the context diagram, identify and elaborate the external interfaces, talk to all the stakeholders work out what the current situation, what's the envisaged future, what are the intermediate configuration states, agree this way forward. Then we're going to look at trial decomposition into subsystems, evaluate the effect on the decompositions in terms of how many organizations involved, what's the complexity of each interface and the sum total of the interfaces, how many are there and what's the risk of implementation of doing it a particular way, uh, and if that eventual risk and the amount of effort involved is OK, then go on. Uh, and for goodness sake, do phase testing, not Big Bang. But if it's not OK, try a different trial decomposition into subsystems to minimise the complexity of the interfaces. And that is the bit that, in my experience, organisations very rarely do. They pretty much stick with the first 
try out the decomposition that they think of and make it work, tacking on more and more sellotape interfaces. Do you call it sellotape? I can't remember. Okay, uh, I won't cover that. Uh, but there is a, sorry, I will just briefly look at that. That requirement, system A shall interface to system V via bearer X, is the requirement from hell. Uh, I would um, urge any organization involved in contracting never to accept such a requirement. And if you're the, the uh, customer, never put out a requirement like that, because what you're asking your contractor to do is to sign a blank check unless you know exactly what bearer X is and you have control over what happens at the system B end. Because it might be proprietary. They might say, no, not telling you what that interface looks like. In which case you've put the contractor for system A in an impossible position. I do treat a little bit about how to deal with that in the book. I've drawn a little arrow diagram underneath. Okay. Ah, this must be my last slide because it's got bullet points in it. Okay, so I've looked at some gaps in the literature and I've started to overcome the lack of a life cycle oriented view of interface evolution. I've looked at some key principles, um, those eight key principles that I'm interested in getting some feedback on. Um, I've stressed the use of interface analysis in architecting systems throughout the life cycle and trying to left shift them. Uh, and more importantly, having introduced the somebody else's problem field, I want to encourage engineers and I would like to encourage everybody in the audience to make sure that you prevent the somebody else's problem field if you have engineers working on your developments and there are interfaces involved, which there almost certainly are, make sure that those interfaces aren't somebody else's problem, that your developers know about them and they are actively addressing them. Okay, and that's about all I have. And yes, and there's the book. I'm holding up a copy. All right, so this is a series of uh, little books. There are only 50 to 60 pages published by the UK chapter of Incosi. Uh, they're very helpful. The Absolute Beginner's Guide too. And the first one in the series was about model-based systems engineering. This is the second one on interfaces. And they've just published the third one on architecture frameworks in case anybody's interested. Uh, and I can provide a, um, a, 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 a hyperlink to where you can get copies from. It's only... Hmm. What would it be in the UK, US? $20. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Paul. And that's all I have. Thank you, Paul. Um, excellent. Um, now we're going to move into the question and answer session. I, know, I saw uh, Jeff, our president, had a couple questions. But I want to make a comment. Is like that, that, that slide just before your conclusion about the requirement from hell. Um, I've personally been on many acquisition efforts where I've seen that. <laughs> and you are exactly right there are open-ended checks yeah and, mm -hmm. and you know you know it is what it is yeah yeah okay um jeff do you want to unmute yourself and maybe ask your question a couple questions to um mr davis directly yes can you hear me yep okay yeah. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Very good lecture. And uh, cello tape is called Scotch tape here in the USA. Oh, yeah. yeah. Scotch tape. Yeah, brand name. Um, but my, my question, I have two questions. My first question has to do with um, the impacts of artificial intelligence and machine learning, which really create sort of non-deterministic or, or fuzzy um, you know, data flows and, and, and system logic and um, operations. Um, what are those impacts on interface definitions and management? And, and how is that going to be managed in the future as more and more uh, large systems, you know, have an AI ML component? All right. 
I need to think about that one. Yeah, um, if, if to put it in context, um, I, I would say, um, you know, your examples of, of, of a rail system are, are somewhat fixed in, in, the, in the sense that the, the lines are, are fixed and, and known, the power voltages are known, the, you know, uh, the schedule is known. There, there's a lot of known aspects to that complex system of systems, but, but a lot of um, AI systems are unknown, right? That they're changing um, as, um, you know, new variables are, are interpreted and, and the system morphs to a, a new state. So how, how is interface okay. meant to right. uh, control um, the situation? I agree that that's the simple version. And to be honest, one answer is that the AI won't help you resolve all the, the electrical and mechanical interfaces, even when they aren't known. Um, but another answer is, I use another example in a training course, which is about European uh, signaling railway signaling i'm sorry I'm, the majority of my background is in defense and aerospace but actually in aerospace some of the same thing applies in that uh you have to construct a safety case um and current legislation both in rail and in aviation is such that you have to be able to produce deterministic responses. Yeah. So you actually need a, 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 a real break, a real um, paradigm shift in the way safety certification is done in order to enable an AI assisted uh, interface management scheme to uh to become valid yeah uh, th th this is a known problem uh it's uh, also one of the problems about uh drone networking yeah uh, because the the safety with autonomously uh piloted drones multiple versions of them in the air uh is a nightmare basically, because if they are all navigating their way and doing collision avoidance using uh, machine learning, their responses, because it is heuristic in nature, their responses are continuously evolving in non-deterministic and non-repeatable uh, manners, which violates current uh, safety certification rules. It will happen, but my best guess is that that won't happen within the next 10 to 15 years. Does that answer the, your question? You're on mute, Jeff. Thank you, Paul. That answers my question. Thank you. Yeah. I like the comment from Joe Kasser, outstanding systems engineer has to see what isn't there. Uh, that's a, a perfect analogy. The, the interfaces are there, you just have to be trained to see them. Anyone else have uh, something they would like to comment on or uh, ask question? Um, Jeff, did you have, there's a second one. You yeah, said. I have a second question, Paul. Similar to my other, uh, my first question, um, really focused on agile software development. That's a, a, a real, um, you know, blossoming, uh, you know, technology trend, uh, of course, here and, and also across the, the world. Um, I, I'm just wondering about the idea of agile interface management or agile interface test. Um, you know, how does, how does interface management and testing keep up with agile development where, you, you know, the development cycle, um, the outputs from the development cycle are not known, you know, at least not known yeah. on a scheduled basis that they're coming out in a, you know, somewhat random order, um, you know, because yeah. speed is so critical with the agile development framework. Um, 
I struggle with the idea of agile interfaces. Um, I'm willing to be shouted down, but my interpretation is that agile only works if you've got your uh, fundamental architecture nailed down early on and you're doing agile development for the components within that framework. Would you agree or disagree? Uh, Paul, I agree. I, th I think that's one of the um, uh, best practices around agile development and including um, yeah. a, a recommendation from SAFE, one of the frameworks um, that my company yeah. uses. I, I got a bit of a shock. <clears throat> I did a lecture tour around the the Baltic States a couple of years ago uh, with a guy, Bo Oppenheim, who wrote about, who is, is uh, really hot on lean and agile. Um, and every, the perceived wisdom at the time was that you never do agile software development on an evolving hardware platform. But he went into the lecture uh, tour and blew that one apart because he had done a lot of consulting work with uh, Elon Musk. And he said, SpaceX are doing it anyway. Hmm. Yeah, they're doing agile development on evolving hardware platforms to the extent that they're uh, rapid prototyping due, uh, with additive manufacture uh, space satellites like every two days and reconfiguring every, everything, including the wiring interfaces. And, and that just blew my mind. I, I just did not know how that could be done, but apparently they're doing it. So um, I'm not the right guy to ask, <laughs> but do, do a bit of research uh, on uh, how, how SpaceX works. Thank you, Paul. I was thinking uh, just another comment is like, um, with all these these eight practices, good good practices you have, you know, each one of those lends itself to a certain level of effort, a certain level of cost. Obviously, yeah. the more thorough you do that stuff, and um, in general, I think you know you got to look at your project and say, okay, what's the impact of me uh, assuming risk on these interfaces, right? If you can assume risk on the interfaces, it breaks since nobody's going to complain, nobody gets killed or whatever, then I think the agile approach would be, you know, like fine. But like if, yeah. if it's, you know, interfaces for a pacemaker or something going to your radio controller or something, then there needs to be a lot more, um, thoroughness in the, the, these, um, conducting these sort of eight best practices that you're yeah just well okay so can you see my best practice eight the phased implementation in yeah. the limiting case what you're doing is producing an n squared chart for each configuration state which is um, the succession of your agile sprints and in a decent MBSE tool, uh, Rhapsody, for example, or Core, or whatever, you can generate, if, if, if you have your, oh, crikey. No, I've forgotten the name of the diagram. Um, you can have your diagrams, uh, your interface block diagrams, N square yeah. output in the form that looks very much like an n squared chart yeah with a, with a with a bit of help so as you go through your agile developments you can have successive uh, configuration state charts that look exactly like this and with a bit of work you can forward project them to see where, where you're going so the next bit of that is this slide uh here which is to say when you evaluate your trial decomposition or what you're going to do in your next agile sprint you're looking at your risk but okay what you're doing is <clears throat> should i try another decomposition what is the likely saving 
as a result of doing that uh, re uh, that iteration compared to how much I am likely to reduce that risk. Okay, because there's a cost of doing every iteration. Right. So it's a return on investment, if you like. If the is the risk acceptable? Is the, are the savings that I am likely to make by having another go worth the effort invested in doing another decomposition? Yeah. 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 Appreciate that, Paul. Well, from the agile point of view, if I put too much into my next sprint with as yet undefined interfaces, does that put the risk up higher than breaking it down into smaller sprints, each of which has lower risk, but there's always an overhead in the level of integration testing and regression testing due to the additional sprint. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Now, Thank you, Paul. That, that's uh, definitely more than the uh, beginner's guide level. <laughs> <laughs>